Assalamualaikum warahmatullah, Sheikh Kamarul, Mr. A.G., distinguished members of the panel, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here on a Saturday morning. Now, before I commence, Sheikh Kamarul, please allow me to clarify one piece of news that uh, has been going around, and that was that uh, I was present along with the A.G. Uh, at the meeting of the Majlis Raja Raja. I'm just a law teacher, an ordinary law teacher. I don't have the opportunity to be present at the Majlis Raja Raja with the Attorney General. Uh, but of course, on a lighter note, um, Mr. A.G., um, if there is a vacancy in the A.G.'s office, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm open to it. <laughs> now, I, I wish to do two things. Number one, to clarify some misconceptions about all the alleged calamities or tragedies that will befall this nation if we accede to the Rome Treaty. And secondly, to offer some justifications for going ahead with the Rome Treaty. Understandably, some of what I have to say, much of what I have to say has already been repeated. Now, uh, can you move on? This Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court was drafted because during the last century, millions of innocent children, millions, Children, women, and men became victims of unimaginable atrocities that deeply shocked the conscience of humanity. So this statute therefore seeks to make four heinous offenses into international crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity, um, war crimes, and the crime of aggression. Also to put an end to impunity or immunity. Um, basically the principle behind this Rome Treaty is that state sovereignty may be a shield against foreign aggression. It cannot be used as a sword to slaughter innocent people. Now, nobody with morality, decency, or even knowledge of religion should feel threatened by the formulation of such moral news. But sadly, there are voices of opposition in our own land to the ratification of this treaty on the ground that it would destroy the immunity of the Malay rulers it will destroy the special position of the Malays, the position of Islam, and it would subject a young de Pertonagong to international arrest and prosecution. In my humble view, these fears are unfounded. In fact, their expression paints us all in an extremely bad light. Um, first of all, the issue of Islam and Malays. Uh, perhaps I'm lacking in imagination, but by no stretch of imagination are Islam Article 3 or Malay Special Position Article 153 threatened in any way by criminalizing genocide, crimes against humanity. Um, but by the way, we signed CEDAW, the Convention on Elimination of Discrimination Against Women in the 1990s, mid-90s, and that did not in any way um, subject our Sharia officials to international uh, prosecution. Uh, then the issue of rulers' immunity has been correctly pointed out. Which immunity are we talking about? In 1993, the immunity was taken away. So this is a very uh, a dishonest and emotional argument. There is no immunity under Malaysian law for the rulers. Um, then the position of the young de Pertonagong. This position is indeed more complex uh, because His Majesty is the supreme head of the Federation, Article 32. His Majesty is the supreme commander of the armed forces, Article 41. The Armed Forces Council acts under his general authority, Article 137, Clause 1. He is the third wing of parliament, Article 44. He appoints dismissive judges uh, on a literal interpretation of the Constitution. The young de Pertonagong is almost like a dictator with critical powers um, in the executive, legislative, judicial, and uh, judicial field and in relation to Islam. Now, opponents of the Rome Statute seem to be interpreting the articles of the Constitution dealing with the young de Pertonagong's powers very literally and in isolation. What they are doing is they are putting the provisions in a keyhole. So they take um, the provision, a, a power of the young de Pertonagong in a keyhole and they ignore everything else in the Constitution. In the overall scheme of our Constitution, our young de Pertonagong is a constitutional, 
not an absolute monarch. He acts on advice, save in those four areas which are mentioned in Article 40, Clause 2, appointment of PM, dissolution of the Devan Rath prematurely. They are not relevant to any matter covered by the ICC or the Rome Statute. So it is humbly submitted that His Majesty the Young de Pertonagong is not liable for any international crimes committed by his subordinates, by rogue soldiers or by rogue commanders uh, for a number of reasons. I've jotted down seven reasons. I'll quickly go over them. Number one, our young de Pertonagong acts on advice. Article 40, Clause 1 and 40, Clause 1A. I don't have the time to read this, but it's very clear. In the performance of his functions under the Constitution and other laws, not just the Constitution, other laws, the young de Pertonagong shall act on advice. And Article 41A underlines that in the exercise of his functions under this Constitution of Federal Law, where the young de Pertonagong is to act in accordance with advice, on advice, after considering advice, the young de Pertonagong shall accept and act in accordance with advice. So our king is a constitutional monarch. In fact, most of the powers of the young de Pertonagong, including declaration of emergency, command of the forces, promulgation of emergency ordinances, they are on advice. Large number of cases from the Privy Council, from the federal court, I know there are a number of army officers who say, since the young de Pertonagong is my supreme commander, if he says bomb Singapore, I'll bomb Singapore. Well, I recommend that these members of the armed forces come for a short 01 course in constitutional law at UM. <laughs> May I point out to you that out of 44 or so indictments by the ICC, not even one, not even one has ever been issued to a constitutional monarch. The best example would be, one of the better examples would be Kampochia. So Pol Pot was prosecuted, uh, his prime minister was prosecuted, Q Sampan was prosecuted, but not Prince Nadom Sihanak. Uh, number two, there's a distinction between the person in whom authority is vested and the person, a body of persons by whom it is exercisable. The law may give, in strict words, it may give power to one person, but actually that power is exercised by another. May I give an example uh, from UITM? Yang Di Pertonagong is the chancellor of University Technology, Mara. But that doesn't mean that he decides uh, who to give a degree to, <laughs> uh, who to give an honorary degree to. The power is exercised by the university. So it's all in the name of the Yang Di Pertonagong. So our king is head of state. He's not head of government. He is the formal. He is not the functional head of state. He reigns. He does not rule. Most of his functions are non-discretionary. Uh, number three, Yang Di Pertonagong is not operationally responsible for the armed forces. In relation to the armed forces, the YDPA is not responsible for matters relating to their operational use, Article 137, Clause 1. I even looked up the Armed Forces Act, 1972, Section 2, defines a commanding officer. The commanding officer is one who is in immediate command of the unit. Now, the young de Pertonagong is not in immediate command of the unit, so he's not the commanding officer. Next one, number four, I, ICC goes only after real culprits. It doesn't go after constitutional monarchs. I gave the example of Pol Pot. Um, uh, next one, number five, responsibility of military commanders and other superiors. I understand that uh, the four academicians who met the Majlis Raja Raja pointed out that under section Article 28 of the Rome Statute, Article 25, uh, His Majesty may be liable for the uh, misdemeanors of rogue soldiers. I looked up these two articles. Actually, it's quite clear that under these articles, a commander will be liable only if he commits, if he orders, if he solicits, if he induces, if he aids, abets, assists the four crimes. Under Article 28, a commander is liable only if he is effectively acting as a military commander, has effective command and control, effective authority and control, effective responsibility and control. So it's quite clear 
Yang di Pratana Gong, in no way is going to be liable as the commander of the armed forces, even though he's the supreme commander. Uh, number six, other constitutional monarchies have signed, 14 sovereign states with constitutional monarchies have signed. They are not suffering any problems, but somehow uh, maybe Malaysia is more prone to these problems. I don't know. <coughs> number seven, genocide convention. Uh, my good friend here, lawyer Rajit and um, uh, Nato Farida also pointed out, we have signed the Geneva Genocide Convention in 1994, 25 years ago, and no problem has occurred, uh, even though in the Genocide Convention there is no immunity. By the way, Malaysia has also signed nearly 100 treaties, and none have caused us to be dragged before international tribunals. Next point is very interesting, so interesting that actually uh, you may think I'm joking, but actually I'm not. LGBT. Uh, our king has been advised that criminal prosecution of minorities like the LGBT minority is a ground for our king's arrest and prosecution. Now, really, that calls for some imagination, isn't it? <coughs> now, there is nothing in the Rome Statute about LGBT. The word LGBT, transgender, sexual minority, sexual preferences, nowhere occur in the Rome Statute. Now, I know Malaysia criminalizes homosexuality, Section 377A Penal Code, but as far as I know, um, um, homosexuality is not a crime against humanity, as far as I know. Uh, <laughs> the Article 7 of the Rome Statute deals with persecution, not prosecution, persecution against any identifiable group or collectivity on political, racial, national, ethnic, cultural, religious, gender, or other grounds that are universally recognized as impermissible. impermissible. And by the way, how does it define gender? It says very clearly, and the term gender is to refer to two sexes, male and female. This is what the statute says. Gender refers to two sexes, male and female. So in the Rome statute, there is no concept of transgender because I think it is not a matter on which there is universal agreement. They wanted to walk the middle path, therefore they said, uh, uh, first of all they said, it must be universally recognized. Secondly, they said two sexes, male and female. So there's no chance of ICC a prosecution of our young Dipartona Gong because Malaysia prosecuted some homosexual. Um, other issues. Um, good news for those who intend to commit um, genocide. Eh? Good news. <laughs> good news. Good news is this. This statute is not retrospective. <laughs> so if you have committed any of these in the past, you are still okay. <laughs> If you have beaten up someone in the bar or you have punched a few reporters, you're still okay. You're still okay. Because, because commission of ordinary crimes under the penal court has nothing to do with the ICC. ICC is about those four crimes. Thirdly, local jurisdiction is not ousted as uh, the learned AG pointed out. The ICC is invoked only if local jurisdiction is not exercised or is unable to be exercised. Uh, next one, history. I won't go into that. We actually began this journey in 1998. The present government simply tried to complete the task. But of course, uh, commencing the journey was okay, but completing it is not okay. <laughs> uh, then the next issue is um, that there has been an allegation that the Yang Di Pertonagong and the Conference of Rulers were not consulted. May I please point out to you the Baba Perlembagan, um, the Majlis Raja Raja must be consulted on the appointment of judges, Article 122B, Auditor General, Public Services Commission, Education Service, and a few other such matters. There is no requirement to consult the uh, Majlis Raja Raja in the matter of signing treaties. Nevertheless, consultation is a democratic practice. It's part of good governance, no harm in consulting. But to say that they should have been consulted, uh, that has no constitutional basis. Uh, next one. Consent of the Conference of Rulers. Consent of the Conference of Rulers is needed under Article 38, Clause 4, Article 2B, 
Article 159, Clause 5, for about 13 or so matters, mostly to do with the privileges, position, honors, and dignities of the rulers, Malay special position, Islam, uh, BM, even the citizenship rights of everyone. Mm -hmm. Ratifying a treaty does not require the prior consent of the Majlis Raja Raja. I'll repeat that. Ratifying a treaty is not a matter on which the government is obliged to obtain the consent of the Majlis Raja Raja. As such, the rejection of the treaty by the Conference of Rulers has no legal effect. Of course, the displeasure of their majesties may be taken into consideration by the government of the day. It has no legal effect. Um, it, it, it's just almost like this. Suppose the Majlis Raja Raja says, um, you cannot abolish the death penalty. Um, that's a, an opinion worthy to take into consideration. It does not repeal any law that has been passed because that's not their, um, their jurisdiction. Now I come to recommendations. Uh, we should not pull back from the ratification of the Rome Statute. Our, instead, our army, police, immigration, uh, NRD officials, and some members of our elite, um, I think they should be briefed on the law, on the dangers, and uh, how to avoid or evade them. <coughs> A parliamentary committee should be appointed, possibly, to discuss the matter in greater detail with public participation. That will be great. At present, the government of Malaysia is liable for all acts in the name of His Majesty. Now, this is just a proposal, Mr. A.G. Um, um, may not be necessary, but if their majesties are really worried that the young Dipartonagong may be prosecuted because uh, we prosecuted some homosexual and so the Agong will go before the ICC. They are worried. Eh? Um, I, I humbly recommend that we have a statute called Young Dipartan Agong Exercise of Functions Act 1957. We already have the statutes. Perhaps a clause could be added there, something to this effect, except in relation to his discretionary powers under the Constitution. All executive authority of the Young Dipartan Agong shall be exercisable by a minister, authority, or official authorized by the cabinet, and the exercise of such authority shall then be attributed to the minister, authority, or official concern for all legal purposes, nationally and internationally. So then it will be very clear, black and white, that the minister concerned will be legally responsible in international courts. Actually, that is the legal position today. But if their majesties are troubled. Um, now, what are the advantages of signing the treaty? First of all, our fidelity to human rights. Uh, demands that we subscribe to this system of international justice. I think it would be a folly not to join hands with this historic institution. The advantages of signing will be many. ICC statute will be in line with the Kuala Lumpur Declaration to Criminalize War, in which I had the privilege of uh, um, um, being one of the um, uh, co-signatories of the Kuala Lumpur Declaration. Um, at that time, started by uh, Mahathir. Our membership of the ICC may dissuade international criminals from hiding in our land to escape prosecution. This point was made earlier. If they enter our shores, we'll have legal justification to extradite them. As a member of the UN and the ICC treaty, we can level considered criticisms against the unwillingness or inability of the ICC to prosecute heinous crimes committed by some Superpowers in occupied Palestine, Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Yemen, Syria, our voice will carry greater weight. We can push for atrocities in Myanmar to be investigated by the UN Security Council. We can approach the UN Security Council to prosecute those who mercilessly downed Malaysia MH17 over eastern Ukraine on 17 July. Our membership of the ICC will be a shining example to eight out of 10 ASEAN members who have not yet ratified the treaty. And we will have better leverage to deal with countries like Myanmar that are causing refugees uh, to uh, come to our shores. Now, final point, no advantage, no advantage to non-ratification. I just want to make this point. Even if you don't ratify, that does not mean that our leaders will be immune from prosecution because um, the international crimes, these four crimes can still be prosecuted in two ways. First of all, the ICC may have jurisdiction if it is authorized by the United Nations Security Council. As uh, 
Mr. A.G. pointed out, Sudan is not a member, and yet the Sudan president was prosecuted because the UN Security Council um, took the decision. Second, the United Nations may create ad hoc tribunals like they did for former Yugoslavia, for Rwanda. So ratification or no ratification. In the present state of international law of crime, perpetrators will have no place to hide. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Shad.